good to be with you again. We're going to continue our study today on God Bless America. It's really about a prophetic perspective on our nation. Uh, biblical prophecy is not centered in telling the future, anticipating what's to come, nearly as much as it is focused upon a God perspective being delivered to his people. The Hebrew prophets were consistently saying, this is what God thinks about your lives to the people of Israel, to, the, to, to generation after generation after generation. It's an important question for you and me. What would God say to the church in America? Now, I know there's not a singular answer, and I wouldn't presume to, to deliver the only answer, but I think it's a question that for you and me to grapple with is significant. What does God have to say to the church in America? If we can understand that, you and I will know how to live more effectively, more, more significantly, more intentionally for the kingdom of God. Enjoy the lesson. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8, God said, I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and a spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Those last few words in that verse are not something to be sprayed for. They are people groups. And what God said to Moses is, we're leaving Egypt and we're going to another land. And he identified the land so Moses would know where they were headed. It's the land where these people live. God had promised that land to Abraham and his descendants forever, hundreds of years earlier. But God said now that the, the scripture says that the, the cup of their unrighteousness had been filled. So they're going to be displaced. God's going to put the Hebrew people in that land he's promised them forever. It would help the United Nations a lot these days if they just read the book of Genesis. A lot of consternation in the planet about the Jewish people on that piece of land. God said they belong there and nobody's moving them. It's, it's not a very fruitful way to spend your life raging against God. He doesn't move much. So God said, we're leaving Egypt to go to a piece of territory, a place on the globe. In Ezekiel chapter 11, we've stepped forward hundreds of years. God kept his promise to Moses. You know the story, the plagues. Egypt is decimated. The Red Sea is parted. They escape Egyptian slavery. God feeds them with manna. He brings water out of the rocks in the desert. He leads them with a pillar of cloud. They get all the way to the promised land. Moses doesn't finish it. Joshua takes them in. They conquer the promised land. They live for hundreds of years with, with judges. Gideon, Deborah, Samson were all judges. The last of the judges is Samuel. And they say, we want a king. And God said, all right. And he chooses the king for them. He chooses Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. They've lived in the, the land that God's promised them for hundreds and hundreds of years. By the time we get to the book of Ezekiel, there's a temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. They have no memory now of Egypt. It's a part of their story. They have holidays when they, when they tell the story, but none of them remember Egypt. It's hundreds and hundreds of years removed from them. And while they are still the chosen people of God, living in the land he promised them with a temple and with daily sacrifices and a high priest, their hearts are a long way away from God. They're still keeping kosher rules. They still have the Torah. They have the law. They still have the Ten Commandments. But their hearts are a long, long way from God. In Ezekiel 11 and verse 9, listen to what God said. I will drive you out of the city, Jerusalem, and hand you over to foreigners and inflict punishment on you. God said, I gave you the land, but now you're leaving. You can't stay here anymore. Their right to live in the promised land was connected to their relationship with Almighty God. And he said, if you'll turn your back on me and it doesn't please you to honor me and you don't want to accept my boundaries, you're not staying here. You're leaving. May I ask you a question? When they were in Babylon, God sent the Babylonian armies in 587 BCE. Nebuchadnezzar's armies encircled Jerusalem. They destroyed it. They literally tore the wall down, destroyed the temple, slaughtered many of the inhabitants of the city. They took some of the brightest and best with them back to Babylon, the first Jewish ghetto in history. There were to be many more. In Babylon, are they still God's chosen people? Absolutely. Absolutely. The scripture says that God disciplines those he loves. I would submit to you, God loved them in the midst of the judgment. But he said, you can't stay in the land if you don't intend to honor me. 
And God gives instructions to Adam. It's Genesis 2.15. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now just as certainly as God placed the Hebrew people, the descendants of Abraham, in that land at the end of the Mediterranean, God placed Adam and Eve in that garden. He created the earth and everything's in it, but the scripture says he planted a garden, a specific place, and he put Adam in the midst of that garden, and he said, I give you authority over it. Tend it, take care of it, that's your job. In fact, God called it work. Did you catch it? He said the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Did you know that work is God's idea? This is before the fall, sin hasn't entered. God created us to work. Work is not evil. Work is not an intrusion into your life. Work is an expression of your faith. Now, after the fall, God amended it, and work became disproportionate. The benefit that comes from the work diminished, and the effort that was required increased. But don't imagine work as an intrusion into your life. We have perverted it and made it, we've put a burden on work that it can't sustain. I hear people say, you know, my job doesn't fulfill me. It's impossible. We bring fulfillment to our jobs. God gave Adam an assignment to to tend that garden, but he placed him in a very specific place. He gave him one thing. He said, it's all yours. Enjoy it. It's for you. But there's one tree, and that one tree you can't touch. If you do, you'll die. You know the story. What did Adam do? Got in line by that tree. If he had been keeping the work that God had given him when the serpent made his way into the garden, Adam would have dressed it before they ever got to the the deception or the sin. But watch what God says. Genesis 3, the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove the man out and he placed him on the east side of the garden. He, He placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden a cherubim, an angel, to guard the entrance to the garden. The place God created for Adam, he forfeited because of the condition of his heart. He drove him out. Now, I've told you on many occasions that the first chapters of Genesis established for us the central principles of Scripture, that the big ideas of the Bible are introduced to us in those first chapters. We meet God as the creator of all things, as the initiator, the sustainer of all things. We meet God as judge of all the earth. He brings a flood. That God defines righteousness and unrighteousness. Well, I believe we're also introduced to another one of those ideas, fundamental ideas of Scripture, that God in his sovereignty, he places us at his his decision at the point in time and the point in the planet where he wants us to be. We don't control the day of our birth nor the location of our birth. We don't choose our, our parents nor our nationality nor our ethnicity. God makes that choice. It's an expression of his sovereignty. And back to the point where we began this morning. I believe God and his sovereignty placed us in this nation. We're a nation of immigrants. We've all come from other places. But God and his sovereignty has orchestrated our presence in this place at this time. And it happens to be a nation on planet Earth in this season that has unprecedented liberty and freedom. We have greater opportunities, more blessings, more privileges than any nation on this planet. It's not perfect. Far from it, as a matter of fact. But amongst the options, it is very unique. That is the blessing of God in our lives. But that blessing does not come without responsibility. It has come come from Almighty God. We're not a nation divine... We're not a nation defined by a specific ethnicity, by the color of our skin or the shape of our eyes. We are a nation of immigrants. We're defined by an idea. We are one nation under God. That is what has bound us together. Most of us came here originally because we weren't overly welcome in other places or we had very limited opportunities and we came here with the imagination that that idea would provide a greater future for us. Now with that comes a responsibility. 
Now, I don't expect the people outside the church to acknowledge that or to embrace that. But for those of us that are within the church, we can't afford to miss this, folks. If we turn our backs on Almighty God, if we turn our backs on His principles, if we don't care about His opinions and His boundaries, do you imagine we will maintain our liberty and freedom? It's insanity. It's certainly unscriptural. What keeps us free isn't that we are exceptional. We're not smarter than everybody else on the planet. Our natural resources aren't that unique. It has been the blessing of Almighty God and the health and the vitality of the church of Jesus Christ in the midst of our people is what affords the blessings of God upon us. That's our responsibility. There's a prayer. They pray in morning prayer these days for our nation. There's a group of people that come to campus uh, seven days a week at 6.30 in the morning to pray for you. They've been doing it for more than 15 years. Haven't missed a day. And there's a prayer they've been praying recently, and in that prayer there's one line that I have heard lately. It, it says that we shouldn't be afraid of the battle. And I, folks, I, I think the church for too long of a season, and I don't mean just this church, but church with a capital C in our nation has been a bit frightened. We've been a bit intimidated. We've been reluctant. Now, it's not a new thing. It's not a new thing. Remember David, King David? We're introduced to him in Scripture when he's just a boy, a teenager. Early teens, it seems. And he's taking to his brothers, who were in the Israelite army, food. And when he gets to the Israelite camp, he happens to hear the champion of the other people, the Philistines, come out and say, it's foolish for us to to all go to battle, let your champion come face me, and whoever wins is the victor. And when Goliath bellowed that challenge, everybody in the Israelite army went and hid in their tent. It, it seems to me a little bit of what the church has done in recent We've been hiding. We've been reluctant to engage our culture. We've been in, reluctant to stand up and, and speak the truth. Remember what David said when he heard Goliath? He said, I got this. Who does he think he is? He has challenged the armies of the living God. Now, the Israelite army had heard Goliath say he was challenging the armies of Saul. And David said he has challenged the armies of the living God. He'll fall. What are you doing in your tents? And they said, well, you know, if you're so bad, you go. Now, if you're reading that casually, it's an enormous mismatch. Goliath is trained as a warrior. He's an imposing physical specimen. His experience and expertise with weaponry and the weapons he has far exceed any training David as they certainly exceed his, his physical ability or strength. Goliath has spear and sword, and David has a rock and a sling. But David has something else. He said, look, when I was watching my father's flock and a, a lion or a bear came, God delivered them into my hands. He couldn't overpower a lion or a bear either. And he said, this Philistine will be no different than those animals. God will deliver him. May I submit to you humbly, it's time for the church to find our faith in a living God. We have been quiet too long. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. We have gathered on this continent in the public square in large numbers in every generation to give thanks to God. And those gatherings of God's people in the public square have been a, a dominant force in the shaping of our nation and its character and our history. They haven't always been revival services. Sometimes we've stood in the public square and said the principles of Scripture dictate that we be different. And we will change. 
But God's people, standing up as God's people to honor the principles of Scripture, has guided us to this point. Now, in this generation, we're not so welcome in the public square. They tell us that the name of Jesus isn't welcome in the classroom or the courtroom. That the name of Jesus probably shouldn't be mentioned in those public places. And we've been a little bit like the Israelite army. We've gone and hidden in our tents. We have lost our way. I don't know. I'm not surprised at the ungodly. It's what they do. What would God say to the church in America today? It's, imp- it's an important question to ask yourself. He has blessed us like no people on this earth. He's given us more opportunity, more freedom, more privilege. I think it's important that we stand in a public square. You know, when I was a child... Stadiums filled with Christians having religious services was as common as a football game. They filled our television sets. You knew what was going to happen next. It happened so frequently, you knew what they had an order of service. You knew what was going to happen. You knew Cliff Barrows was going to convene the citywide choir and George Beverly Shea was going to sing. And you knew as soon as he stopped preaching, lots of people were coming forward. That's the part I look forward to because when it was over, what I wanted to watch would come back on television. You know, our children aren't familiar with that. They haven't seen it. Folks, we will lose our liberty and freedom if we fail to be the church. Do you think God loves us more than he loved the Hebrew people? He told them they couldn't stay in that land if they didn't want a relationship with him. Do you think we'll maintain our blessings if we don't want a relationship with God? Again, this isn't about criticizing others. This is about working on our own attitudes and our own hearts. I was out of the country when the Supreme Court made their ruling on family and sexuality. And I saw a photograph a day or two later of the White House with the rainbow imposed upon it. And the first time I saw it, I thought it had to be photoshopped. It was one of those internet hoaxes that are far too frequent. When I found out it was real, it sent chills down my spine. We were a nation that was founded with the idea of one nation under God. And if we publicly flaunt God's boundaries, God will respond. Now, that's not a message towards anybody but the church. And it's not a message towards any single group of people. God defined moral and immoral. And sexual morality, God defined for us. He didn't ask us for a a referendum on that. He said, my people will honor these boundaries. And and sexual immorality uh, across the the whole spectrum of the expressions of that is destructive to us. That's not to condemn any person. We're to have compassion on people who struggle. It's appropriate to invite them towards the truth and and to have expressions of kindness and love for them. But there's a difference in in setting aside God's boundaries and saying it's okay to embrace ungodliness. The church has to be the church. Not in a hate-filled way. Not in a condemning way. But if we fail to be the voice God called us to be, we will forfeit our blessings There is abundant evidence for that idea. And without that prophetic perspective, we're adrift. We have to care. I've got just a couple of minutes left. (laughs) I've been spending a lot of time lately in the book of Ezekiel, reading just a little bit ahead of our Bible reading together. Uh, Ezekiel is the prophet in the Bible that God uses during the exile. It was 587 BCE when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem and God's people go into exile, but God didn't abandon his people. Jeremiah is the prophet that says to the people, the the Babylonians are coming, you better do something, the Babylonians are coming. And Ezekiel's the prophet that God uses to speak to the people when they've been driven out of their land. It intrigues me. It's a fascinating perspective. God didn't abandon them. He didn't say, I'm angry with you. I hate you. I'll have nothing to do with you. He sent them someone along to give them God's perspective. He said, you'll come back to the land. You know, God's discipline in our lives 
is a necessary part of growing up in the Lord. The book of Hebrews says if God doesn't discipline you, he doesn't love you. You're an illegitimate child. We want the blessings of God, but we really don't want the discipline of God. Now, I would encourage you, if you're in a place where, you know, Bible says endure hardship is discipline. If you're walking through a season that's not easy, perhaps you should say to the Lord, Lord, I want to learn the lesson. I'm not telling you if it's a difficult, not get back in line for mistreatment or inappropriate treatment. I'm not saying that. I'm saying to say to the Lord, Lord, I want your perspective on my heart and my life. If there's anything in me that's harmful or hurtful or diminishes my relationship with you, help me to see it. We need a God perspective, folks. We've spent most of our energy trying to convince God that our perspective he needs to pay attention to. We need to invest a little energy in saying, God, help me to see myself and my home and my business and my life and my nation as you see us. Two phrases God used with Ezekiel that I'll hand you really quickly. One, it's used dozens of times in the book of Ezekiel and almost nowhere else in the Hebrew Bible. It's this little phrase, they'll know that I'm the Lord. You see, lordship is a question to be resolved in every individual heart. And God says over and over and over and over and over again in Ezekiel that they will know that I am the Lord. In Ezekiel 12, it says to the, to the Israelites, They'll know that I'm the Lord when I disperse them among the nations and scatter them throughout the countries. They have a temple, holidays, rules, high priest, and God said, they have forgotten that I'm the Lord. But they'll know that I'm the Lord when I scatter them around the earth. They will remember, they will look back, and they will know there is an almighty God in heaven. You know, we lose sight of that. We kind of distill God down. It's like we have a divine reduction. And we kind of come out with a morphed God. He's kind of like a cuddly teddy bear or a benevolent uncle that visits once in a while with a sack full of goodies. And then as soon as we've got his goodies, we hope he leaves because he's kind of an intrusion. And God said, they will know that I'm the Lord. And the book of Ezekiel closes with another prophetic statement in chapter 38. He said, I will show my greatness and my holiness. I'll make myself known in the sight of many nations. And then they will know that I'm the Lord. He starts out saying the Israelites will know that I'm the Lord. And then he says the nations will know that I'm the Lord. You know the point of the book of Revelation, the end game in this whole scenario in time, is that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the assignment of the church is to hold up that banner. And if we lose sight that he is the Lord of all, we are failing in our assignment. It's important. The courage to own our faith in the sphere of our influence matters. And there's one last idea in Ezekiel that I'll give you today or this morning. When any Israelite sets up idols in their heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before his face, where was the idol set up? In their heart. So it wasn't first and foremost about some image that was carved out of something else. He said, in your heart, idolatry begins in our heart. Idolatry in its essence is about priority. It's about whatever you give first priority to. What do you look to as the resource of your life, the stabilization of your life, the hope of your life, the joy of your life? So it really isn't, even for the Israelites, it wasn't about the Canaanite fertility gods, they worshiped them because they wanted a more prosperous life. The idol in their hearts was greed. And I would submit to you that idolatry is as rampant in contemporary American Christendom as it was in biblical Israel. Now, we haven't carved statues, but in our hearts, we have assigned top priority to comfort or convenience or pleasure or wealth or power or our favorite hobby, or our favorite something. And we haven't rejected God. We haven't cast him out. The Israelites had a temple and, and a whole pattern of worship. They had just given the priority in their heart to something else. And it seems to me we're a bit guilty on this point. We come to church, but the priorities of our hearts, the first priority is someplace else. It's idolatry. Now, I'm not recruiting you to come to church more often. I'm not signing you up for some new 
meeting or class or point of service. I'm not asking for more money. I'm asking you to ask the Lord to help you look at your heart. Because the outcomes are important to the generations who follow us. I've got a degree in history. I don't know exactly when our drift started, but I can tell you that for several decades, we've been consuming the blessings of God without tending the responsibilities, and it will not continue to work well. It seems to me that the 60s was a turning point, that the message was to cast off restraint. We didn't want to be limited in so many ways. And as we have continued to cast off restraint, we have become increasingly brazen in our expressions of rebellion to the point that we, we say God didn't even have the right any longer to determine our gender. Well, it's, it's an expression of rebellion, but it hadn't started with any current messaging. It, it started along the way, and it's been able to flourish because the church wasn't being the church. So what do we do? Well, I think we go back to the beginning. We remember that we're one nation under God, that the best things in our lives have come from Almighty God. Now, I believe it's difficult to overstate the significance of the church, of Christ followers in our culture. Jesus said we're salt and light, that we're difference makers. See, I don't believe there's a political solution for the problems that face us as a people. I don't believe our answer is in a particular individual or a particular party. I think the resolution begins in our hearts before Pennsylvania Avenue can honor the Lord, it has to start on Main Street in each of our communities. And so you and I become very significant. Christ in you makes a difference. I wanna pray for you before we go. Father, I thank you for every person. I thank you for your truth in their heart. And I pray we'll have the courage to honor you in all that we are and all that we do in our homes, in our places of business, in our churches, wherever you lead us. Thank you for it. Be merciful to us as a people. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online at intendministries.org and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today and if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.